All right, today we will be starting the last subsection of the first part of the course uh, on preliminaries of continuum or right fundamentals of continuum mechanics, and the subsection is called balance laws. So now that we have all the tools available at our disposal, uh, not only the mathematical tools but also concepts of uh, of essentially. Uh, uh, kinematics, okay, we are going to move on to um, balance laws or kinetics. In other words, we're going to study the reasons behind the motion that we analyzed in a very general setting um, in the, during the past three to four lectures. So balance laws. Now, um, we have all some experience with balance laws, so can you tell me what are some balance laws that you're familiar with? Energy balance, so let's put that at number four. Okay. That would also be the first law of thermodynamics, right? Okay, what else? Linear and angular momentum balance. Mass, right? Uh, you already propose that it be conserved and not only appears in some balanced flows. I'll tell you what the distinction is, but uh, we will eventually invoke conservation of mass, but let's at this stage just write mass balance. Okay, anything else that you might be uh, interested in? Entropy, right. So that would be uh, the fifth one, right? And typically that's an inequality, but uh, that inequality, let's say, if it's always greater than zero, uh, I can add some negative production rate or some production rate to the equality and set it equal to zero. Okay, so I can always write it as an equality. So I'm going to write an entropy balance. And that would be the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Um, these are predominantly what one would be interested in a relative setting. It would be ideally, uh, let's say, desired and uh, uh, really beneficial that we cover all of these, but we do not have time to cover all of these. Um, and in the context of this course, within the concept of this course, uh, the aim is to cover the minimal fundamentals possible and then go ahead and apply them uh, in some cases of practical interest to people with different backgrounds, right? So what I will be covering is the first three and then these I will not. And I will be abbreviating these every now and then. Uh, mass balance, linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance. Okay, those are the three things that we're going to cover. And these uh, really have some fundamental implications, all of them. Um, eventually, they will help us introduce the concept of stress, the stress tensor that goes in there. And within the particular context that we're working with, uh, the angular momentum balance will enforce some additional properties on that stress tensor or a class of stress tensors. Um, and right, and those quantities eventually we'll think about in more detail during the application section. Um, and mass balance in itself, uh, you will see that the procedure with which we attack all of these three are very, very similar, philosophically, let's say. But just in the context of mass balance within this course, I'm going to go ahead one step.
and uh, give you a broader view of how such a balance would be formulated in a uh, relatively general setting. I won't do that in the remaining ones uh, just for mass balance. So those are the three that we are going to cover. Uh, now, you should notice that here goes balanced lows, right? It says low, meaning that we assume their validity. Um, in other words, there's nothing to prove about them. We're going to state them, and we're going to study their implications and their reformulations, let's say, in uh, different configurations. Um, you take them or leave them, okay? okay? So we're going to assume that they hold in a particular context, and we're going to rephrase them, but there has to be a starting point. That starting point is going to be a law that we're going to assume uh, is going to hold. And I'm going to state the particular context, uh, especially in uh, linear and eventually angular, the particular context within which it's supposed to hold. Um, so the mass balance, linear momentum balance, and the angular momentum balance, it's what we're going to refer to as laws of motion. The laws that dictate how the object moves, uh, so that would be translation and rotation, the combined effect, as well as uh, what happens to its mass as that motion occurs, or the motion as a result of the fact that something happens to the mass. Let's say you have a rocket and that rocket propels that uh, mass and the rocket moves, right? That would be also a interaction between the three. Uh, that's not exactly the type of system that we are going to study in this course, but as I said, in the context of mass balance, I'm going to state things relatively generally, so that effect will be, uh, to some extent, included in the formulation. Um, in the remaining two, I will follow a simpler presentation. But, so these three are our laws of motion, and so we're going to study the kinetics, right? Why that motion occurs, how it occurs, and that directly interacts with the kinematics. So, in other words, we have descriptions of motion. Using those descriptions of motion, we're trying to eventually going to try and formulate the kinetics, um, kinetics of a body. Okay, so now let me, let me begin with a few remarks on the um, limitation, the common limitation of the presentation that we're going to follow. And that is that we're going to assume a closed system. Okay. Um, a closed system, right? Remember, we have a configuration, let's say a spatial configuration, and I draw a object. It has a boundary around it, right? This is our reference configuration, R0 the boundary del R0, right? And there is a material point with reference configuration x, and it moves to the current configuration to a spatial point x. And if you do that map for all of the uh, points in the reference configuration or associated with the reference configuration, you get the spatial configuration of the body. You see how it looks now. And that's a map that depends on time as well as position. Uh, so now, it's a system that I'm trying to analyze. What I mean that it's a closed system is that this boundary of this region, it's a material surface. That's what it means, okay? In other words, what it means, right, what's a material surface? All of the points on that boundary move with the particles of the body. Hence, it follows that I do not allow any material to escape or enter that domain, okay? Hence, the closed system. Okay. Um, uh, that, that, that's the first remark. The second remark is whenever, whenever I draw a configuration, that could be the reference or the current configuration, you don't necessarily have to think of this as being 
a whole system. Let's say this doesn't have to be the whole car. It could just be the door of the car. It could be a piece of it, right? So in other words, I take a system and I cut a piece of it and I would be analyzing essentially the free body diagram, let's say in the language of right, um, undergraduate mechanics, the free body diagram of a portion of a structure, right? That's what these really represent. And of course, due to the fact that I'm cutting this away from the rest of the system, probably forces some interaction between, right, let's say in terms of forces, et cetera, between this free body diagram and the remaining portion of the system. But sure, those forces and whatever they are, eventually we will see them, they are included within this picture and on whatever acts on that picture. So you don't have to think of this as being the whole, right? Let's keep that in mind. It could be the whole, right? It just doesn't have to be. Okay, so, um, so, so just, to, just to remind you, I could have, let's say, again, I'll borrow a simple example from right, mechanics, undergrad mechanics. Okay, let's say I have a truss structure and There are some forces acting on that truss structure. So what I could do now is I could actually go ahead and try to analyze a piece of that system, right? Let's say, um, let's say this one, right, over here, that single bar. So I would have, of course, some reaction forces because there is a condition here that restricts the motion of that joint, right? And that is a, if you like, a displacement boundary condition. In the few instances that that will appear, I think I might abbreviate that as, as, as BC. Um, so that's a boundary condition. And of course, we have additionally some force boundary conditions. Now, in the context of um, continuum mechanics, we're not going to really call these force boundary conditions, but they embody the alternative to displacement boundary conditions. You don't restrict motion, you apply force. In this case, a point force. Normally, you would apply uh, physically a distributed force over a portion of the domain, and possibly it's going to be on the boundary, hence the name of the boundary condition. Okay, but not necessarily so. You can apply it to the volume. We're gonna see that as well. Okay, so when you cut that portion, you're going to have a reaction force, Rx, Ry, and uh, there's going to be some um, also, internal forces as well as the external applied one. Okay, so then that would be the picture. So what I was trying to say is the system that we're analyzing, so this might be what someone is interested in, but when you draw this picture, it's not necessarily referring to the whole thing, it could be referring to this one. But of course, due to the fact that you are cutting away a piece of the system, uh, you have to somehow ensure that you include the interaction that is induced through that cut. In other words, due to the fact that there is another part and that other part is interacting with the part that you're trying to analyze. So in the end, we can always do this and uh, carry on with our analysis. And whatever I'm going to state in the context of continuum mechanics applies equally well to either that or that picture, or for that matter, any further subdivision of that picture. Um, now, having said this, I'm not going to talk about the boundary conditions from now on. 
Okay, the boundary condition. So I'm not going to. Sometimes people draw the boundary condition here. So for instance, they would say, oh, I have something and I'm going to apply forces and it will move and deform because, right? And those boundary conditions, remember, do not have to be static. They don't have to be constant in space or time. So in other words, the displacement boundary condition at that point doesn't have to be, if there's a displacement boundary condition in a certain portion on the boundary, then the value of displacement here doesn't have to be the same as there, and this displacement could change with time. So what does that mean? Here's a displacement boundary condition. I hold something. So first of all, I'm going to move this part to the left and that part to the right, and then it rotates, right? So the values don't have to be the same. Plus, it's rotating increasingly with time. So they don't, they are not constant in time either, right? So they don't have to be constant. And so anyway, some people would, for instance, perhaps draw something like this, and that would indicate that that's a displacement boundary condition. And then there would be a portion of the domain where you apply a force. So because that's the alternative. In a general setting, I'd like to also indicate that. And a way to indicate that would be, uh, for instance, that I apply a certain force distribution. Okay, the arrows really, I've just chosen them arbitrarily. So there's a force per unit area on the surface that I'm applying, in this case, in a compressive manner, sort of. And again, this doesn't have to be constant in space. And it doesn't have to be constant in time, okay? Uh, well, what happens on the portion that I've not indicated anything? It goes without saying by convention that there, there is nothing applied, which means that it's zero force, actually, okay? Uh, so having said that, these are, of course, important because eventually what we will state as balanced laws, you will see these are differential equations. And if you want to eventually solve a differential equation, you need appropriate boundary conditions. But since that's not the context or the uh, focus of this course, I'm never going to draw these boundary conditions explicitly, but you should remember, of course, there are some boundary conditions. That's why eventually the object moves and deforms. But our goal here is not to solve that problem. Our goal is to formulate in the language of continuum mechanics the equations, differential equations that govern that motion. Okay? What activates that motion is the boundary conditions. What governs it is the differential equ equation itself. So the boundary conditions will not be shown explicitly. OK. So let's then proceed with the first one, which is the mass balance. All right, so now the procedure for the mass balance and for all the other ones, there, as I said, they're going to be similar. And typically it proceeds as follows. There is a concept that I'm interested in. In this case, it's the mass. So of course, I have some notation for it, M, let's say. And M is the total mass. And I have, remember, a conceptual uh, object called the body. And this body has particles. And let's say so many particles that it makes sense to uh, think of not as sum, but sort of some sort of integration. This integration, what it does is it sums up the masses of the individual particles of the body. Each one has a very small mass dm. So uh, I'm not going to really indicate this integral from now on. But whenever you see an integral that has to do with something that it's not a volume integral. You can't think that it's over the body. So I sum them up. Now, this, however, is not something that is quite convenient. I know that it's not convenient to work with the body. And here it manifests itself very clearly. Uh, what would be nice is to have an integral over a volume. Okay, That I can carry out very easily. So here I essentially implicitly invoke 
uh, the idea of a continuum. And I say that there is, the, the particles have masses, sure, perhaps, but uh, I can associate point-wise a density of mass, sort of smear out this thing because there are so many particles. I can smear this out and introduce the concept of a density of mass. And once I do that, that density is mass per unit volume, so mass per unit volume, and then I can have an integral over a volume. That accomplishes my goal of having a convenient uh, framework to work with. And I can do that, let's say, in the reference configuration. I would say that there is a density of mass, and let's call it rho naught, and rho naught referring to the fact that uh, it has to do with the reference configuration, and integral over the referential volume, the capital V. Okay, so that would be the referential mass density. Um, then, of course, what you can also do is um, you can introduce a density of the mass per unit volume of the spatial, the deformed or current configuration. So that would be the spatial mass density. Okay, so now that I have these two concepts, of course, mass is either expressed now like this or like that, and they are equal to one another. I can start with this expression over here, and I can write r rho dv, which is equal to the total mass, and I can now recall uh, the map of infinitesimal line elements, from volume elements, from reference to current configuration. It's governed by the Jacobian of mapping, the determinant of deformation gradient tensor, D capital V, right? So that's equal to now, I have, once I do that map, essentially mathematically what I do is I switching the variables of integration. And because now I'm integrating the same quantity but over a different domain, I need to make sure that the ratio between infinitesimal pieces of integration domains, they are captured accurately, and that ratio is j. So now I'm switching the domain of integration. So now this is rho j d capital B, right? And now if you compare that expression with this expression, what necessarily comes out is that rho naught must be equal to rho j. Okay? So that is a nice expression. Now I know how the referential and spatial mass densities are related to one another depending on uh, something that has to do with the motion, okay? Now, what we have to realize at this stage is that so far there is no balanced law. I'm just, I just define mass, I introduce two different notions of it, and this even by itself, it's not mass because it doesn't tell me in particular what happens to either rho naught or rho with time. That's what a mass balance or any balanced law does. It introduces uh, some variation in time and analyzes that variation. So here I don't see that. Here all I see is a, is a map between two quantities that live in two different sort of configurations. Okay? So now let us do invoke the mass balance. And since I have to um, write a few lines, let me do it over here. Now the mass balance, what it does is it looks at and all the other balanced laws as well, the rate of change of the quantity that I'm interested in time, okay? Next, it will be linear momentum balance. Then it will be angular momentum balance, okay? And then it says something about it. For mass balance, the way that we're going to analyze is that this will be equal to zero. And it will be equal to zero because I'm interested in a closed system, okay? And then, because it's equal to zero, I don't only have a balanced law, I actually have a conservation law. Mass is conserved, that's what it means. So now this is where we invoke mass balance, okay? This is where it comes in. So now I know what mass is, so let me go ahead and analyze what it is, right? So I can do it in two parts. The first one is I can do DDT, integral over rho naught, R naught, um, 
rho naught d capital V. This is the reference configuration. The reference configuration does not depend on time. So the points of this domain, they are not moving anywhere. It's just a reference domain for me for, that I introduced for communion. So this derivative tracks the points of the particles. It's the material time derivative. And because R0 is fixed, it's already fixing the particle sort of, tracking them appropriately. I can just move this derivative inside. And so all I have is rho naught dot d capital V is equal to zero, okay? And this gives me one form, if you like, of the balance law, okay? Rho not dot equals zero, okay? Now, what is the difference of this statement and that statement conceptually? It's the fact that this one is looking at the whole object and it's saying that the total mass does not change with time. So it's a global statement, okay, an integral statement. And this is a differential or a local statement which says that a local quantity, and it doesn't matter where you are looking, at any point in the reference configuration there is a density and you're saying that that density does not change with time. Okay? rho naught dot equals zero. So that's a local statement, that's an integral statement. And it turns out that, uh, that for every balance law, we're going to have this picture, an integral picture and a local picture. And it turns out that the original form of the balance law is always an integral picture because that's very natural. In this case, the total mass does not change with time for a closed system, okay? Uh, now, not only that, uh, for every balance law, we're going to have these integral and local statements stated in two different forms, referential as well as spatial forms, okay? So there is a question, so let me take that before that part. Uh, so in Latin, uh, for example, we have a body and we are, you know, somehow uh, expanding one portion of it and compressing another portion of it. Okay. So total mass is the same. So, so, so he's saying, I have a body. I'm repeating the question because on the videos you don't hear them. Uh, you have an object. Somehow the total mass is conserved, but one portion is getting squished. The other portion expands so as to accommodate that somehow, uh, right? Change. You trans. You have a balloon. You squish one end. It goes. The air goes onto the other end, right? So the total mass is preserved, right? Right, on the inside, you can have a rigid container, uh, right? You could do that. The, there, the density that you're thinking of is the spatial one, not the referential one, okay? The referential one can change, okay? okay? That's why the, the formulation in this case is very simple in terms of the referential one. Now, because I have a closed system and because mass is conserved, I can, again, in this case, it makes sense to think of rho naught as actually I don't have fancy continuum mechanics. I'm doing covering just the basics. So it makes sense to think of actually rho naught as the initial density at a given point. And that reference configuration doesn't change with time, and hence the density that you've assigned to that point is naturally not changing with time either. It's like saying the time derivative of capital X, the referential position, does not change with time. It doesn't. So it's equivalent to that. Okay. Um, all right. Now, what happens if we do it in the spatial configuration? Now, in the spatial configuration, again, I'm going to go ahead and take the material time derivative, okay, over R rho dv, okay? Um, now, let me first make a note here before I write down what the uh, result is. So if I want to go ahead and take that derivative, okay, um, this is not equal to, so in this case I moved time derivative inside. In this case if I do that and I write rho dv equals, or time derivative it moves inside and I have rho dot dv, it's already wrong. And how do I know that it is actually uh, wrong? Right? 
that is going to something that I'm going to analyze uh, soon. And I'll, I'll give you another interpretation of it shortly. But presently, the reason why I know it's wrong is because this is supposed to track the motion of the particles as a material time derivative. This region, the boundary of that region is a material surface. So this region is supposed to track the motion of the system that I'm trying to analyze. So this region is moving in time. This one is not. So if I'm trying to take a material time derivative, I better keep track of the motion of that domain as well. Conceptually, you can do it in a very simple way. It's not equal to this, but it's rather equal to plus, okay, so, or it's equal to, let's write it like this. Sometimes this is a notation that I use. I put a bar to indicate that the dot applies to this whole object. That's the sole purpose of the bar. So it's not rho dot dv, but it's rho dv dot. The whole thing changes with time. The volume locally might be expanding or contracting because the body is moving with the particles or the domain is moving with the particles. And hence, you have rho dot dv plus rho dv dot. Okay. So now, I could already carry out what I want to do based on that expression, but let me go back up here. Okay? I'm going to show you my preferred way of handling with such integrals, or of most people, I suppose. Okay? So what you do is you want to do away with this complication of the fact that dv is changing. And so you do a trick, and that trick is you reformulate the integral into a domain that does not change with time. And how do I do that? I've already done it. It's rho j d capital B. I've replaced this with j d capital B. That's my new domain of integration. And now that it has changed, what I can do is I can <coughs> move now this derivative inside, and I can say rho j dot does not change with time. Okay? And that's certainly true. So just like in that case, what remains in the integral should be equal to 0. So rho j dot is equal to 0. Now, what is rho j dot? It's equal to rho dot plus rho j dot. Okay? And j dot is something that we have expressed before. It's I missed the j there. Sorry. J dot is J divergence of the velocity field, and that is supposed to be equal to zero. And hence, I end up with the final expression for what this means. It means, so J is always non-zero, so what has to be is equal to, what has to be equal to zero is rho dot plus rho divergence of Now, two comments that I told you I would make. So first of all, I know immediately, forgetting about the fact that R is actually changing with time, okay, suppose I did that, I should stop and immediately realize that that's not possible. Why? Because for this to be true, then this is the mass balance. This is equal to 0. So rho dot has to be equal to 0. Okay? If rho dot is equal to 0, this term is gone, and rho j dot is equal to rho j dot. This is equal to 0 because this is rho naught. Okay? Rho naught dot is equal to 0. So 0 equals rho j dot. Rho is not 0, so j dot has to be 0. In other words, you have automatically a incompressible motion. But not every material is incompressible, so hence it follows that the argument is incorrect. If it's incompressible, you were lucky. You got the correct result, but that's just by chance. Okay. Now, the second comment is you could <coughs> look at this integral over here and write it as J D capital V and then take its derivative. And that would be J dot, which is day J divergence of V, D capital V. And then you could go ahead, combine these two quantities and obtain divergence of V and referential volume in the spatial configuration. Okay. So this is just, so what I've done here, going to dV, and using the map between the two infinitesimal volume elements, 
and then taking the time derivative is intrinsically equivalent to this procedure. Okay? But what I would suggest is you go ahead with that procedure. In other words, you map always the configurations. That's a nicer way to approach the issue, and we're going to see that, um, the advantages of that, uh, when we consider the other balanced laws. Okay? So if you combine these two now, you will see that for this to be equal to zero, rho dot plus rho divergence of v has to be equal to zero, and that's what I found out in this case as well. Okay? All right, so now what I have is the overall, the referential integral and local forms as well as the spatial integral and local forms of the mass balance. Okay? And the local forms always manifest themselves as sort of, as, as some type of a differential equation. Uh, in this case, um, well, there is time, but also some derivatives with respect to space. And the integral forms work in terms of the original concept of, in this case, mass, and tells you that mass does not change. Okay? So if we put those together, Let's do it over here. We have the integral and local forms of mass balance. And both of these can be expressed in terms of spatial or referential quantities. I will draw a similar table for the remaining two balance laws as well. Okay? So in this case, integral spatial, time rate of change of the total mass, right? So you have to, the way to recall these expressions, right, for linear and angular momentum balance as well, you have to recall what they mean. If you recall what they mean, you can state the, it as well. Okay? Um, so I'm interested in the spatial integral. So I have to work with spatial quantities, and the integral looks at the whole concept, the, in this case, the mass. I want to state the total mass in terms of spatial quantities. That's what it is. And the law says that with respect to time, the variation is equal to 0 because of the assumptions that I made. In this case, it's a conservation law. Now, once you have that, then you can map it to the current configuration. And the procedure that I've suggested is you map the uh, domains of integration pull it back, that's what this said uh, that you do. In this case, I'm switching the domain of integration from spatial to current. One says that I'm pulling everything back to the reference configuration, and I'm carrying out the reference configuration, uh, the operation on the reference configuration. So that's what you do. You pull back, you carry out the operation, and then you switch back the domain of integration again to the current configuration and end up with a spatial expression. In this case, that's rho dot plus rho dv equals zero. Okay. Even if you forget this expression, deriving it once you're competent with the concept and with the procedure with which we obtain the final form, it should take you like a minute. Okay. All right. So then there is the referential form. Again, the concept doesn't change the total mass, but now I want to express it in terms of referential quantities. So that's what I have. And now the local form can be obtained in a very simple manner. All it says is rho naught doesn't change with time. Now, of course, though you will remember from your undergraduate fluid mechanics course that the local spatial form is actually something not uh, it's something that you've seen before when you were studying um, balance laws for formulating um, fluid mechanics. Okay. All right. Questions so far? Yes. Well, J. Uh, I, I want a physical motion, so J is always positive and it remains so, right? So 
if this is zero, I can take it into J parentheses, but J is positive anyway, so what remains has to be equal to zero. So that's what I've done. But it's important, of course, that j is never zero for that argument to hold, and it never is in my case. Further questions? OK. So here is one case that I'm going to deviate from the usual procedure, and I just want to give you a hint of what this thing looks like if you have actually an open system formulation. Um, and I'm going to do it only for mass, you could really be very careful and do the same thing for linear and angular momentum balance as well, as well as eventually, by the way, the way the balance law is developed is more or less the same for uh, energy and um, entropy balance as well. But, so we're not covering those. Likewise, this generalization that I'm going to cover only for mass balance could be done in a similar fashion for all the others as well. All right. Uh, so let's do that, put that at the back of our minds, just, set, just so that you see that generalization. And this is conceptually similar to that uh, example that I gave, uh, a fly in a room and you're trying to measure the uh, temperature that the fly experiences, the rate of change of the temperature. There I had three velocities, the Eulerian Lagrangian and an ALE, arbitrary Eulerian Lagrangian, Lagrangian Eulerian uh, velocity. Uh, the idea is similar to that in that sense, okay? And practically, it applies in similar scenarios where, 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 let's say, you have a numerical procedure, say you have a finite element procedure, you have a mesh, and that mesh is not really tracking the object. It is moving, it's not stationary, but it doesn't move with the object. In that case, you, have, you need updated forms of your balanced laws to apply in a numerical setting. Um, so. Let us consider this. <clears throat> uh, now, there are different terminologies, if you'll remember. Um, and perhaps that, that language, the terminology, differs from perhaps subject area of specialization to another one. Um, there are concepts like controlled volume, controlled mass that you've probably seen on graduate um, fluid courses as well. Um, I'm just going to give you a picture that certainly is consistent with the way I'm presenting it. Um, let me com complete the state at first, and then if you have questions, we can, of course, discuss it. But I, wa I will eventually give you examples of, let's say, of how that picture applies to some cases of interest. So I want to look at ver open versus closed system, because closed is what I've proposed so far, and that's what I'm stating everything for. So suppose now I have some material. This material could be, or this body could be very large. And as I said, so that's some material region, let's say. But I'm not necessarily analyzing the whole material region. I am interested in a portion of it. And that portion I'm always indicating with R, okay? Now, this R, however, could be open or closed, right? So I put a mark on the particles of this region. And now this region starts moving. If this black domain, this, this line, if it conforms to the particles of, the, of this body, of this object, then this becomes a material surface and I have a closed object, okay, a closed system. Now, however, if this region, which will now for me eventually a region of integration of a quantity uh, that I'm interested in, like density, okay? If this region is not going to, if this line is not going to track the motion of the particles, the particles, the object will move, and if, the, if, it's, if it's tracking, it will move with the object. If not, very soon there will be a mismatch between the region of integration and the objects within 
that originally happened to be in that region. Okay? So those objects will move, some of them will move out, and new ones will move perhaps into that domain. The velocity of the line does not conform with the velocity of the particles. That would be an open one. Okay? So that's the context in which I'm going to write what I'm going to write soon. So first of all, let me restate the balance law in a slightly different way. So it says that in the, so, and everything is naturally in the spatial configuration because that's where this action is taking place. If I'm in the reference, I have a nice match anyway. Um, so it's natural to look at this in the spatial configuration. So this is my statement of the balance law. And now let me go ahead and expand this. So this is rho dot, it's the material time derivative. So, but rho changes not only with time, but also with position. So rho dot is partial with respect to time plus its gradient dotted with the velocity. So this whole thing is equal to rho dot. Okay. Plus rho divergence of v. Um, now I'm going to write this in index notation. So I have gradient dotted with the velocity vector. So this is rho comma i vi. And this is rho divergence of v plus rho vi comma i. Okay? And what you see here is I have a comma i and a comma i and vi appears in both of them, rho appears in both of them. This can be written as rho vi comma i. And therefore, this expression can be written as del rho over del t plus divergence of, now I'm going to use these brackets because I have two objects in there, rho and v. So I put the local spatial form of mass balance in a slightly different form. And that form is more natural to work with. So now I can put this back into the integral. And uh, this is for interpretation purposes. So I already have it. Why put it back into the integral? Uh, we'll, see it. we'll see it together. Um, and I'm going to put it back into an integral. And you will see that an expression appears that is called the Reynolds transport theorem. Um, and let's call this, because I have to write it once again, I want to save a little bit of effort, RTT for a closed system. Why is it a closed system? Because I'm going to look at the rate of change of total mass within a region which tracks the motion of the particles, OK? And now, therefore, this is equal to 0. This is where the balanced law comes in. This is the physics statement, OK? Now, on the other hand, yes, this is the physics statement, but then there is the math part of it as well. So once you give me this, I don't know if it's equal to 0 or not. Well. I do need to know what R is, and in this case, it's a closed system. So I will proceed with the analysis according to that. Uh, but um, uh, again, it's equal to 0 uh, due, to the, due to the fact that we're invoking the balance law. So let me carry on with the math as well now on the right-hand side. And the math says that I can move this derivative inside, and I have the balance equation. And that's nothing but rho dot rho dv, v, right? I've already derived that in the previous board. Okay, I'm not repeating it. It's the same thing, time derivative. And now what I've done is I've re-expressed that integrand. I have del rho del t plus divergence of rho v dv. Okay. 
And now I'm going to split these two terms. The first term is an integration over the domain. It contains the partial derivative of rho, spatial integral. And then I have the second integral. And notice that the second integral is a divergence of something. And now I can, it's a vector. It directly, you can directly apply the divergence term. It becomes an integration over the boundary of the material region. And you have rho v dot n integral over the boundary. And that is equal to 0. Let's call this equation one. Okay, and let me also write down the interpretation for all of these. Okay, once again, so we have on the left hand side, I'm writing inward so that we can carry out the same interpretation for an alternative representation. This expression says or monitors the rate of change of mass uh, in a volume whose boundary conforms to the material velocity. And conforms here means really that the system is closed. But then there are two integrals on the right hand side. So on the left, that's a clean interpretation. Rate of change of mass, that's total mass, in a volume, the boundary of which is a material surface. Okay? On the right hand side, I have, however, two integrals. At a given instant, that's my region of integration. And within that domain, the density is locally changing. And because it's changing, that contributes to the rate of change of mass. But at the same time, the boundary of the domain is moving at a certain velocity so as to encompass more or, I don't know, less material. But that velocity happens to be exactly equal to the material velocity, right? The boundary of the domain is, let's say, let's say it's expanding. It's expanding, okay? But the particles are also running away from the boundary. The particles are also moving. So the domain is moving, the particles are also moving. On the boundary, the motion of the domain is exactly equal to the motion of the particles. Okay? That's what's special about this boundary integral. Okay? Um, right, so let me write those two as well. So the volume contains a row distribution which changes with time. And here, um, the volume attempts, let's say, to encompass more particles, or I don't know, less particles, at a velocity which happens to be material velocity. 
All right. So now remember I told you that now we're going to look at the other scenario where the boundary is not going to conform to the motion of the particles and therefore just an instant later there will be a mismatch between the domain of integration and the particular set of things that I'm trying to uh, analyze. So there can be transfer of mass in or outside of my domain of integration. So now that's what I'm going to state. And this is going to be the Reynolds transport theorem now for an open system because the boundary of the volume is not a material surface. So in general, um, and we could discuss this really for a long time. Um, I'm, just re I'm just stating the result. So for an open system, now I'm going to go ahead and track the, so first there is a, at any given instant, there is a total mass within my domain of integration, but, and this domain of integration is going to change with time because it's moving, but that motion is not going to be is going to be independent of the particles. So therefore, when I take the time derivative, I'm not going to be anymore tracking the motion of the particles. I'm going to be tracking, if you like, the boundary of this domain, which is independently moving from the particles. I'm still tracking something, so there is a concept that is very similar to the material time derivative, but what I'm tracking is not the particles, but rather this, the boundary of this domain that it has an independent velocity, okay? So I want to introduce, therefore, a notation that is like a material time derivative, but you're not tracking the particles, you're tracking the motion of this domain of integration. So it's capital DDT. Now beware, in the context of continuum mechanics and numerical applications, similar Notations, I've warned you several times, similar notations appear in different contexts. Some people use this as the material time derivative notation, but in our case it's clear. That one is material time derivative, this one, and that one is something else. So, uh, now first of all, I can do the math, but before I do the math, I already know that the result in general is not going to be equal to zero, because I'm not tracking the part, it's the, dom the domain boundary is not a material surface, so this probably is not going to be equal to zero. Okay, so now therefore I will have the rate of change of total mass in this domain, I will express it as being something, okay, but I don't really know what it is. So it's some sort of balance law eventually, it could be a balance law, uh, but it's certainly not a conservation law. Now, but now I can forget about whatever it's equal to and concentrate on the math. So I'm going to do the math part, right? So um, now it turns out that when you do the math part, and this is where I'm saying I'm skipping the details, the outcome is very elegant and it's remarkably, well, remarkably similar to this result. And it says that the total rate of change of mass, rate of change of total mass in a domain, okay, let's write that. So, rate of change of mass in a volume, okay? So let me put dots there, okay? Um, whose boundary moves at an independent velocity And independent really has to do with the concept of open now. Okay, so it's going to be an open system. Um, and because it's moving at an independent velocity, it can engulf um, more or less material at certain portions of the boundary, perhaps more at certain portions less. Okay. Now. I don't really need to know exactly how the whole domain is moving. It turns out that 
I only need to know its velocity on the boundary. We already have seen an example here. I need to know only the material velocity on the boundary in the case of a, of a, of a closed system. So now, this object is going to be, this, this equal, um, left hand side is going to be expressed in terms of uh, two integrals. And the first one is going to only monitor the integral of the rate of change of the density at a given point in the domain, okay, plus, sorry, let me just write the result. Right? So, um, there is a, the volume contains momentarily, momentarily they are overlapping, let's say, right? Momentarily they are overlapping, and at that instance, there is a time rate of change that I can monitor at every point within my domain. That's one contribution. But now, the domain of the boundary is also moving, and that motion occurs at a particular velocity w. If that motion, so the body moves. If that motion conforms to the motion of the body, they move together. There is no mismatch. And hence, in that case, the result would indeed be equal to zero. That would be a conservation law. But now, the motion is going to be independent from the motion of the body. And that motion is characterized by velocity w on the boundary. So it's not necessarily equal to v. But the expression you see, the way the total thing is decomposed is exactly the same. A given instant, you have one integral, and then there is some information coming from the boundary. Now, let's see if that expression does make sense. Okay? So at this stage, I know that this is not equal to 0, um, and I know that that is equal to 0. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 1. I'm going to subtract 2 from 1. Okay? And let me write down the result over here. So I don't know if we can get both boards momentarily, but I will subtract that minus this. So small d dt minus capital D T T is equal to this minus that. Whether the domain is moving with the body or independently from it, this is an integral at a given instant. At that instant, the volumes are the same. So these two cancel each other. It's exactly the same integral. And these two become within the domain that momentarily has the same shape, whether or not it's moving with the body. It's a given domain. Uh, and on that integral, on that boundary, there is an integral rho v minus w. Okay, I'm going to put this term, originally it's d dt, small d dt, right? That minus capital. I'm going to put this also to the right-hand side, and I'm going to obtain d dt, right? Integral r um, rho dv is equal to capital D dt okay this is one form that I like to see dot n da okay now remember this is not equal to zero indeed it cannot be because this is equal to zero if this were also equal to zero then v and w necessarily have to match. Okay? So that's equal to 0. And because it's equal to 0, although this is a form that's perhaps nice to see, and it has its own interpretations, because this is equal to 0, I can take and directly express this term. Originally, I didn't know what it was. I knew only that it's not equal to 0. But now, I will be able to calculate what it is. And it's equal to 
And now I have my balance law. Okay? This is actually a mass balance for a open system. I'm looking at the total rate of the rate of change of total mass within a domain whose boundary does not conform to the motion of the particles, and therefore possible change of mass is, po is, is expected, right? And this is how you calculate that change of mass because you know how the particles move and you know which domain you're dealing with, okay? And it's calculatable, right? Now, let us see if uh, um, that expression makes sense. Questions on any part of the derivation so far? Now I'm going to give you some interpretations to show you that this does make sense. Questions on the derivation? No, okay. Um, so, some special cases. Let's say that um, W is equal to zero. Now, let's go back here for a second. Okay. Ah, uh, not really. It's a system that doesn't move anywhere. Okay. It's a domain. Now, it's completely Eulerian. Okay. So, now, this statement was for a Lagrangian one. The boundary of the domain tracks the motion of the particles. That's a Lagrangian way of thinking. Now, the Eulerian way of thinking would be, I have a domain which doesn't move anywhere, and I let the whole material flow through it, okay? Uh, it doesn't move anywhere, that means W is equal to zero, okay? Now, what I expect, Nevertheless, the implications, this way or that way, no matter how you formulate it, the implication has to be the same. So first of all, I see from here that zero is equal to that. So the integral of this, this integral is minus that integral, right? That, that's, that has to hold, okay. So now I go here and I interpret what it means for W. So W is equal to zero. I have an earlier, so I'm tracking the, uh, motion of a uh, domain that doesn't move anywhere. So it's a trivial tracking. I don't have to put so much effort into it. So that's the rate of change in a domain that doesn't move anywhere. Material flows through it, and for sure, the total mass is going to change somehow. W is equal to zero, and I obtain minus rho V dot M, okay? Which is what I'm supposed to obtain. I just told you that this is what I expect. Now, physically, what does it mean? It means that there is a certain flux Density times the velocity, there is a certain flux, and you're only interested in the normal flux because the tangential one never enters the domain. It just slides by the domain. Right? You're interested in the normal flux of mass into or out of the domain. And that's what, with W equals zero, this integral delivers you exactly. Okay? So if W is equal to zero minus V dot N, Could be greater than zero, that would be a mass influx. Or it could be, of course, less than zero, then it could be a mass efflux. Okay. So if V dot N itself it's negative, it means mass is entering, right? That's why it's with a negative sign. It's influx, and it should be so because then the mass will be increasing, right? If this is the whole thing is positive, then mass is increasing. Otherwise, it's decreasing, there's an efflux. So that's one case, okay? And there are many other cases in between. Let me switch to another extreme where, in this case, right, the domain is not moving, the mass, the material is moving. Let's switch to a different case. Suppose I have some density field, but the material is not moving anywhere, but locally, perhaps, the density is fluctuating or rapidly increasing or rapidly decreasing, but the material is stationary. But I have a domain of integration which can move, okay? So let's say, the first of all, the density is not changing at all, right? Even if the density is not changing, okay, from the fact that the domain is increasing, let's say, its shape, 
right? It will engulf more material in its domain of integration. So the total mass that you are monitoring within that domain of integration is changing, right? Um, or it could be shrinking, and then in that case, the total mass would decrease. So another extreme scenario would be where uh, V is equal to zero, right? The material, or V dot N really is equal to zero, but let's say V is equal to zero. In that case, W N greater than zero, let's look at that scenario, the volume is expanding. Volume expands. Um, to engulf more material. And then there are all the other possibilities that lie in between. So we could proceed with the analysis of the balance law in a very, very identical manner for the remaining uh, balance laws, like linear momentum balance, for instance, and we could eventually obtain similar equations, right? So suppose, for instance, right, uh, what would happen in the case of a rocket, right? In the case of a rocket, your domain of integration is the rocket, okay? You're interested in what happens to the rocket, but the rocket itself is just your the object that you are trying to analyze. So it has a velocity w, but then it ejects, let's say, some mass, right? And that's the, prop like, to, to induce propulsion. And on the boundary, there has to be a mismatch, we know, between the velocity of the rocket and of the mass that is injecting, so that it propels the rocket upwards or wherever it's going, right? So, but that information, the fact that it propels and exerts some force, has to appear in the linear momentum balance. Of course, mass balance of that system is also needed, but the, how it propels and contributes to the motion of the record would require that we state linear momentum balance as an open like, system. Okay? And we're not going to do that, but we could okay, in a very similar uh, manner. Right? 